Welcome back. This is Extra Politics TV, and I'm Alfred Lambermont Weber, and we're very privileged today to have uh, independent scientist Loren Murray coming to us from Berkeley, California, in a special program uh, on global fascism. Welcome, Loren. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Alfred, for covering this. Well, I know that uh, today's program is in some ways groundbreaking. It's essentially um, uh, a case study on how uh, uh, global fascism is using U.S. President, UC, UC President, University of California President, Janet Napolitano with Homeland Security, Security, FEMA, and the nuke labs as a mechanism for overthrow of the United States. This is a, a sort of a, a, a methodology that can be used throughout the U.S. Uh, and uh, am I stating this correctly? Actually, it's a template for the entire planet, um, and it's uh, Janet Napolitano has already made contracts in 15 Commonwealth countries to provide Homeland Security and FEMA uh, oversight. So I don't know if they're treaties or if they're agreements, but they are official. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is what is coming to other countries who sign up for U.S. Homeland Security and FEMA. And I'd like to remind you and in, in, inform people that Homeland Security is based on the Phoenix program, which was a product of the, the Vietnam War in the U.S. military. And it was set up in Vietnam to defeat the Vietnam civilian support of the Viet Cong resistance. So um, it was underground torture chambers, it was uh, FEMA and Homeland Security prison camps, it was murders, it was assassination teams, and that is what FEMA the Federal Emergency Management Agency and Homeland Secur Security. That's what their agenda is really about. It's to control and eliminate any resistance in any country that it is invited to, um, to, uh, to keep them out of interfering with this uh, global fascist rollout. And so this is a template that they're now rolling out in the Berkeley, California Bay Area. First place in the United States, that's correct. Well, uh, let's start with Janet Napolitano's background and her arrival at the University of California as its president in mid-October 2013. Well, it was announced in June of, uh, or maybe late May of uh, 2013, that Janet Napolitano, the top cop in the United States as um, head of uh, Homeland Security, that she was now hired as the University of California president. That was very shocking, and there were objections all over all of the campuses, not only from students, but faculty also, who were upset about it and wondered what in the world she was being hired to run a university for and two nuclear weapons labs uh, when she had been the head of Homeland Security and border issues and uh, a lot of controversial things. She's never been popular anywhere at any time. And um, she was also governor of Arizona. So 
uh, the University of California basically hired her without any, um, I don't think they even interviewed anyone else for the job. It was just like an overnight secret deal and boom, she was in. So uh, they never pay any attention to protests by the faculty and students anyway. So we're stuck with her. But now the full agenda is rolling out. And uh, she didn't come here to be UC president. She came here to be the president of fascism and to spread it all over the world from the headquarters of the University of California and the U.S. Nuclear Weapons Laboratory. Right. So, how exactly, uh, uh, how exactly is this manifesting? And how did you first begin to come to understand this? Well, when I looked up her background, that was very interesting. Um, you know, how did she get so high in politics in Arizona so fast, and then she had a helicopter ride right into Homeland Security? How does that happen? She's got a special background. She's a special person, and it's a very good uh, reason to investigate in depth who she really is. And um, I believe that she is probably out of the Italian and Jewish mafia that was established in Chicago uh, by the 1920s. And uh, 10 of the Jewish mafia in Chicago, the big ones, they divided the United States up into 10 regions and each of them took one of those 10 regions. Uh, they're basically administrative regions. And um, she came out of Arizona, I think Phoenix, and uh, Phoenix is where that, that criminal boss went from Chicago. So I believe that's where she came from. Um, I haven't been able to c confirm that yet, but her father was a medical doctor in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And of course, that is um, the home headquarters to the um, Los Alamos Nuclear Weapons Lab and also WIP, the, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project for Underground Storage of Nuclear Waste. And um, I just don't know anything else about her. It's, it's very mysterious. She did arrive uh, in October of 2013 in the San Francisco Bay Area as the UC president. And uh, she did um, have a, um, an advanced false flag uh, celebration of her arrival with a gigantic explosion underground between two of the main administrative uh, campus buildings on the UC Berkeley campus when uh, there was thought to be a bomb attack underground on the campus between two of the main administrative buildings. And um, it turned out to be uh, a false flag. Uh, the, the campus said that someone had been underground uh, cutting copper cables that link the Lawrence Berkeley lab where the Manhattan Project started to the UC Berkeley campus, but that's all very, very heavily guarded. It was all underground, and uh, so that explanation doesn't make sense at all. Now, uh, once she arrived in October, um, she did a fall, uh, fall, uh, early winter setup by visiting all of the UC campuses and introducing herself taking uh, a lay of the land survey before she um, moved into the UC president's office, which is in downtown Oakland. So she's got a big job. Uh, Homeland Security was a bigger job. And um, I'm sure that she'll have lots of help. I'm certain that she has controllers who tell her what to do and how to do it. And um, 
on January 1st, 2014, the first day of the new year, all hell broke loose with Homeland Security and FEMA taking over the entire Bay Area. And it's been a nightmare that just gets worse every day. Right. Well, um, uh, in our in our conversations, uh, you you have begun to describe almost a nomenclature of uh, it's almost a military style or a paramilitary style takeover uh, with different types of troops and different types of of um, paramilitary deputized civilians, some of which are controlled by, by apparent uh, mind control units. Could you begin to break down how this is being done and what technologies are being used? Well, it's not very much fun to uh, sit here and go through it and live through it and be targeted like everybody else, but um, it's the only way you can really learn um, the details and the rollout and who's involved and how it's being carried out. And because I'm a very target, targeted personality um, in this area because of my opposition to the nuclear weapons program and the University of California involvement, and I always have been, um, I get more attention than most people, and so I learn more. And um, what happened on January 1st is, and in the in the following months, is that uh, we saw a very heavy increase in chemtrail spraying. In other words, there were at least and still today, in uh, July of 2014, six months later, uh, there are layers of chemtrail uh, planes flying over the Bay Area and spraying in the morning and in the evening. And I discovered that these chemtrails planes are dreamliners that are built by Boeing. They're big airplanes that are built for commercial purposes and for uh, very long distance uh, flying. And uh, someone sent me a, a, a survey of, of all the planes coming into Seattle a few months ago after this had started. And each of the planes is uh, designated the flight number, the airline, things like that because it's a, it's a commercial real-time report that anyone can access on the internet. And I noticed that maybe six or eight or ten planes were coming in together at a time in sort of a stacked stream with no identification on them. There was no ID reported on these planes on this official site. And I said, well, um, maybe, it, maybe it has an origin for the flights. And sure enough, all of the planes coming in to the Seattle area to land at commercial and military airports had um, uh, airport of origin or, or, or the, uh, the de deportation, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the origin of the flight. And they were, the unmarked planes were from Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California out in the desert. So these are Air Force uh, sponsored planes doing the chemtrailing, at least uh, the planes coming into Seattle. And they were coming in from the ocean, sort of from a southwest direction. So they had been spraying offshore or they had flown offshore from where they had been spraying. And uh, we're getting um, a lot of them spraying every day. And some of the very low altitude flights at about a thousand feet, these are very strange because they have a chemtrail that they spray. 
and it completely disappears in six seconds. In the uh, whatever the carrier is, the uh, solvent or whatever, it's highly volatile and it evaporates completely with no trace of it in six seconds. And I know there are pathogens such as staph. Um, I believe there are uh, perhaps lice and fleas, eggs and so forth. We're having uh, flea epidemics now at the wrong time of the year. And um, if you go outside without a hat on, you end up with a, um, a, a staph uh, ring along the hairline of staph pustules. And so I always wear gloves and completely cover up and wear a hat. And um, it makes all the roads shiny, whatever is in the chemtrails. I don't know if it's plastics or what is in it. It's a combination cocktail, and I'm sure they change it. Uh, but it's certainly making people sick. Uh, they're, they're causing very cold weather and then very hot weather to fluctuate and that damages and compromises immune systems and creates pathways and opportunities for whatever the pathogens and the chemicals and the radiation from Fukushima in the air already. These are all interacting and multiplying the effects of each other. So this seems like a targeted uh, population, it certainly is. A, a, a targeted but depopulation. It is eugenics. Are, are yes. Bio, this is bio warfare. Yes, it is. And this, on, is, uh, this is prohibited by international law. This uh, is genocide. This is absolutely genocide. Um, I heard some rumor that the U.S. Congress had passed a law a new law recently that chemtrails are legal no matter what's in them. Um, so, I mean, Obama and Congress are operating outside of the Constitution. They're violating U.S. laws. They're eroding the Constitution. And there's no, I don't hear anyone speaking out or objecting to it. I don't even know what's going on in other parts of the U.S. So that basically, uh, since January 1st, 2014, when Napolitano took over as UC president, they have made Berkeley, and by extension, the Bay Area a gas chamber. Uh, that's exactly what they've done. And they're also turning it into a prison camp with uh, frequencies as the barbed wire. And I will talk about that in a minute. Um, I just wanted to finish one more thing with the chemtrails. In the black communities in Oakland, the city of Oakland, um, they have added new chemicals to the municipal drinking water uh, that give it a very bad taste. And that has not happened in the uh, white communities or the affluent areas. Uh, they are also pumping uh, ozone, which rolls along the ground, and it's very, very toxic to living things. Um, they're, they're pumping that out into the poor black communities in East Oakland around the Oracle Sports Stadium where the 49ers play. And uh, the Oakland A's, I'm, I'm sorry. It's a huge football st stadium for the whole uh, East Bay. And the ozone, uh, where it's um, being pumped into the black neighborhoods, you can tell where it is because birds are dying in the bushes and screaming and flapping and they're in horrible pain until they finally die. Uh, so that's sort of the canary in the gold mine telling us uh, where that stuff is, is being pumped around. And they're using some fluid dynamics method of heating up the air uh, so that it makes um, high pressure fences that you can't see. 
so it doesn't flow anywhere where they don't want it to um, be uh, active. It's, it's, uh, it's frightening. It's very frightening, Alfred. This is unprecedented in U.S. history, and it's not going to get better, and this will go on to other countries as well. This interview is a warning to all countries around the world, all governments, all leaders, and all citizens to know and understand that they must um, resist this, they must oppose it, they must investigate what their own governments are doing and stand in the way because you can't undo it once they're established. Now, do you, ju just to get more deeply into it, do you think that this is uh, because the Air Force is involved and it's so systematic, do you think that this is conceived as an experiment where they'll measure the die-off and the, and the uh, people fleeing the area and, and you know, is it, it, is it an experiment in extermination? Well, it's, in, it's no longer an experiment. They've been, they've been experimenting with eugenics all through the, 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 the uh, 1900s. Uh, the 20th century, uh, Chernobyl, um, the atomic bombs, it started with the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, we took the Japanese bioweapons program from them at the end of World War II, which they had conducted on human beings, prison prisoners, military prisoners in prison camps in Manchuria. And we got the rocket program, uh, Werner von Braun and, and other scientists developed that for Germany. So we got that from Germany as well as other technologies. And then of course we got the electromagnetic frequencies, the Tesla um, technology and, and other exotic technologies from the, the Soviet Union. Um, and it took, it's taken since 1945 to test all of these systems, integrate them, package them, train, use them in other foreign wars. That's where the experimentation goes. And now they're ready. They put it all together and their master plan is a one world government and a world takeover. They have to overthrow the United States first. So Janet Napolitano is ensconced as the UC president on the West Coast. She will be rolling up Canada, the United States, and Mexico, the western regions, uh, the West Coast areas, uh, where 85% 85, 85 of Americans live uh, within 200 miles of the coastlines. So they're doing the same thing on the East Coast and eventually they will move that roll up into the interior um, and uh, which includes the NAFTA highway. So this essentially is the same strategy that was used in the Phoenix program in Vietnam. Yes it is, exactly the same. And what we're seeing now uh, since January 1st, 2014 is very, very organized, very synchronized, very well funded, probably from black budgets, um, rollouts of, for instance, uh, gang stalkers on the streets. These are organized gang stalkers. They are either paid or they're rewarded in some way. The first wave of them were homeless people and it was during the cold and rainy months of the winter. Um, they were uh, fitted out with electronic cop toys which they uh, patrol the streets with and they just walk up and down the street zapping people with these very painful electromagnetic frequencies that almost cripple you. I mean a lot of the people are crippled or they can just point it at you and throw you up in the air and you land flat on your back on the ground. 
that's I've seen that happening to women in the streets, older women, uh, young people, and uh, there will be a couple of UC students or or some of their tricksters standing around with a cell phone in their hand laughing. So it's coming out of the University of California in this area, but um, I know that a, a, a year or two ago, the police were rounding up homeless people and telling them to go to certain cities like San Mateo uh, near Palo Alto and Stanford University and they were organizing them in some kind of housing to use them now and they're bringing them into communities in big tour buses at night when uh, no one is around and notices it and so suddenly they were sitting on benches and walking up and down the streets all over San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley zapping people and uh, the cops and the military, the military is really running this, um, uh, they would, uh, would use them now along with the cops to do this gang stalking, organized gang stalking, but also they were getting rid of them because these people are living outside, they have poor, very poor diets and hygiene, they don't have any money. A lot of them are there because they're mentally ill or they have drug habits. Their lives have fallen apart. Another very large component are the six soldiers who have come back since 1990 from Iraq and Afghanistan and they're just uh, completely destroyed by exposure to depleted uranium and other nuclear weapons the U.S. is illegally using on foreign battlefields. So they use them until they die in the streets. They want to get rid of them anyway. Um, and then they disappear them. They're shipped out to other cities or they, uh, they may be put in, in underground prisons or FEMA camps. We don't really know. Um, and they do seem to change them. Uh, they go to a more athletic, better trained um, uh, bigger, healthier uh, people, and that's what they're doing now. It is changing over time. Every month or three weeks or so, they bring in a new component with bigger cop toys, and um, they're going into all of the restaurants. They're in the coffee houses. They're on the BART uh, subway trains. They're on public buses. They're everywhere. You can't go anywhere without them being there. And um, if you're a particularly targeted person, you're on some kind of a list, and they're at your bank when you arrive there. Um, they do constant surveillance. They know everything about what you're doing, and if you uh, don't publicize or speak openly about what you're doing for the day, uh, it takes them longer to scrabble when you show up unexpectedly. So the best way to deal with them is to be off script all the time. So these are sort of the equivalent of the brown shirts during the, the, the Nazi buildup in the 30s. Is that, is that sort of a rough equivalent? That's, that's correct. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Now, the people with the cop toys, the cop toys are even in a hierarchy. Um, you will see, for instance, uh, a friend of mine was on a public bus in Berkeley uh, a couple months ago, and there were only four or five people on the bus. The bus drivers are not happy about this, but there's not very much they can do. Um, they don't like it. On the, on the subway trains, the BART trains, the BART employees seem to be some of them part of it. Um, not so on the buses yet. But uh, this friend of mine was sitting there and he was getting hit with a cop toy. And there were only four or five people there. Um, young people and couples. And then there was one old black woman and she was sitting there with her purse on her knees and it was pointed straight at my friend. 
So he started talking in a loud voice about these pop toys and about the frequency attacks and and what we were seeing and and reporting. And um, all of a sudden, he leaned forward uh, right into the face of the black woman and said, Isn't that right? And she, she got really nervous, and she jumped up and jumped off at the very next bus stop. It wasn't even her bus stop. And she was so nervous, she didn't even wait for the bus to drive off. She opened her purse and pulled out this cop toy that was about a foot square and it was um, a couple inches thick and it didn't even have any letters on the buttons that she was supposed to push to make these different applications uh, transmit from it. Um, they were colored buttons. They were color coded so people who can't read uh, can still use them and be gang stalkers. So she pulled it out and the bus driver was laughing. Everyone on the bus was laughing in hysterics. And she didn't even look up at the people on the bus. And as she was madly trying to push all the buttons to turn it off, a cop car drove by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how is it that this weaponry and this network of weaponry got infiltrated into this network of gang stalkers. How did that come about? Was that in the Bush Senior, in the Reagan, in the Clinton administration, in all of these? How did that come about? Well, the answer to that is in the Wall Street Journal in 1993. And there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, a very long and detailed article, about a classified meeting at Johns Hopkins University uh, over a five-day period in the Applied Physics Laboratory. And it was organized by U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno Edward Teller, from, uh, who's known as Dr. Strangelove, the psychopath from the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, um, and a Hungarian, I might like to add. Um, he was there at the meeting also, as well as uh, military officers, generals, and so forth. And there were 5,000 businessmen at that meeting with uh, the cops, law enforcement representatives from all over the U.S. There were also 500 scientists who spent one week demonstrating all of these new cop toys that had been tried in foreign wars and were now being turned over to the uh, police departments all over the U.S. Uh, the reason Edward Teller was there is because the Livermore and the Los Alamos nuclear weapons labs, as well as other facilities that are related to weapons development, they are the, are the, they are the entities that develop the cop toys. And it all fits in with the new nanotechnology initiative, which is like a boom town overnight. It went from $500,000 a year of uh, funding, official funding for nanotechnology research, to billions of dollars in just a few years. And uh, the nanotechnology is an integral part a very, very important component I learned of this whole uh, Homeland Security FEMA cop toy takeover of the United States and other countries. It is fascist in conception, it is fascist in application, and it is fascist in implementation. This is a military operation. It is not a civilian operation. This is a military overthrow of the United States 
and the University of California and other universities are one of the most important collaborators in this overthrow. How, how would you define then, quote, overthrow of the United States? Because this is a very new type of infiltration and subversion by uh, this police and technology infrastructure. So how would you define overthrow? Well, an overthrow is when a country is infiltrated. It can be by foreign foreigners. It can be invaded by foreign militaries. Or it can be overthrown from within. And we have the shadow of skull and bones over the United States. 85% of the key positions in the U.S. government are held by skilled and bones men and being a Yale graduate yourself you're familiar with the reputation and the agenda of skull and bones. Um, it is a secret society with ties to the top echelons of global world power and it that world power is centered in Vienna in Prussia Vienna is the old capital of Prussia, and uh, it's uh, it, the Vienna, the Vienna School of Arts and Sciences, the uh, Austrian, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the uh, Habsburg uh, dynasties that ruled that area, very very large territory. And it all it all goes back to the the Holy Roman Roman Empire and and the Roman Empire um, when it colonized Egypt. So these are very 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 old signs and symbols and mechanisms and concepts that are being carried out that go back to the Egyptian and even the Mesopotamian period. Those methods work. They've worked for thousands of years, and that's why they're using them now. So the Phoenix program, Vietnam, uh, Homeland Security, FEMA, this is nothing new. Gang stalking was uh, a mechanism in, in the Catholic Church for over a thousand years to control the Christians who are members of the Catholic Church. But it goes back to uh, pre the pre-Christian era and gang stalking occurs even in indigenous indigenous societies. It's a mechanism for social control. Now, now you maintain even if we look at uh, this particular template that they are focusing on in the Bay Area, that you're tracing it back even to the British monarchy. Oh, uh, it's funded by the British monarchy. It's in the interest of the British monarchy. This is Queen Elizabeth taking the colonies back, and they will be very severely punished for the American Revolution. Could, could you sort of run us through that? Uh, uh, the takeover of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, the BP, Fukushima, uh, the weaponization of, of UC Berkeley, all, all of that. Yes. The um, University of California has had the exclusive contract that has never been offered to anyone else until a, a couple years ago since World War II to manage the U.S. nuclear weapons laboratories. Now, it's a unique situation to have a university holding the weapon of mass destruction contract for a government with a huge military like the United States. So you have to ask how did that come about? And it, it occurred in uh, World War II when the U.S. wanted to create nuclear weapons 
it turns out that the U.S. nuclear weapons program, the British, uh, the German, the um, American, and the Japanese nuclear weapons programs all came from one template um, and one origin, and that is the the Habsburg. Uh, Austro-Hungarian Holy Roman Empire region and people behind it and the Prussians have always been very fascistic and the soldiers and the military have been the most fascistic uh, in in Europe uh, Hitler was born in Vienna he is a Prussian product although he was German I think um, it's uh, he, he's Prussian in thinking and everything else. So the atomic bomb project, that template came from the Prussians, from Vienna, from the Vienna School and those scientists. They were transported or, or brought to the United States mostly by industrialists with ties to Austria and Vienna. Um, post-1900 and the attempt to build atomic bombs the concept was even pre-1900 with the birth of uh, nuclear physics and atomic physics and also Tesla's research and technologies in, in energy and um, so the, the atomic bombs in World War II brought this renaissance in nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, the nucleus, the energy in the nucleus, and uh, that does include uh, the, the Tesla technologies as well. Although they weren't as advanced in that research as they were um, nuclear physics, atomic experimental physics. So, um, so Vietnam was a place to uh, test the post-World War II uh, technologies that came out of developing weapons for World War II and then to advance the application, the use, uh, or develop new programs such as Project Popeye in Vietnam, which the U.S. military conducted to begin um, weather warfare and uh, they tested it in Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam in other words to cause rain um, and make the the roads all muddy so that uh, transport transportation couldn't get through supply routes were compromised where the civilian population of Vietnam was providing food and other support to the Viet Cong resistance and um, so that application project Popeye became part of the HARP program uh, which of course is the huge new antenna system weapon of mass destruction uh, jointly developed by the US and the Soviet Union under the cover of the Cold War um, and uh, then the other program is, of course, the Phoenix program, which we've mentioned, prison camps and so forth, to um, incarcerate or to uh, demobilize the resistance to this military takeover. Um, it's all illegal. Uh, the FEMA was an Oliver North product in Vietnam. It's illegal. It was the, the Federal Emergency Military Agency, and he brought it to the U.S. Uh, he was tried for uh, crimes in Vietnam, and, and so was Admiral Poindexter. But um, they went through their trials. Um, they had felonies, and they went right on developing garbage for the, the military. And they're um, some, two of the really big characters behind transferring these technologies from Vietnam to the United States government to apply to the civilian population. It's all illegal. It's all a violation of the Constitution. Um, but you see, all of our, uh, our homeland security, our National Guardsmen who were for the states, 
uh, and the governors of the states to protect their own states and and uh, citizens in each each uh, state uh, that was all compromised and um, and undermined by sacrificing and deliberately sending our national guardsmen who are not for foreign wars they were just sent to uh, be baked in the desert and filled with uranium in a, Iraq and Afghanistan and, and other locations so we've lost our domestic military resistance which is the National Guard and we now have um, multinational uh, exercises going on that started with the Occupy movement in the US and the Urban Shield is what it's called and the Urban Shield exercises in the San Francisco Bay Area occurred on the UC Berkeley campus. Is that crazy or is that crazy? It started two years ago and we had the Israeli defense forces here on the Berkeley campus in full military uniform with weapons. Um, we had um, the uh, Dubai forces, other Gulf Coast uh, countries were represented. I believe Oman had a military presence here. Um, and so they were all doing military exercises on the Berkeley campus. Why didn't they do them in an armory or a military base around the Bay Area? Uh, Travis Air Force Base is not very far away. Why were they doing it on the Berkeley campus? Well, it gives away the real role of the University of California which is a weapons of mass destruction bomb and missile and bullet factory and exotic weapons and that is the real purpose of the university of california and it always has been now um uh shifting shifting just a bit but actually taking this template in in the University of California and in Berkeley and uh, bringing in Janet Napolitano as the president of the University of California, you talk about the hundred New World Order cities right. that the Rockefeller Foundation has designated. Could you talk about that in this larger context? Yes. Um I had an email or a Skype discussion with uh, a woman in uh, New Zealand from the South Island. And this started maybe about six months ago and Alfred, I was truly horrified, horrified at what she had to tell me about what's happening to the South Island in New Zealand. It's being annexed by Queen Elizabeth and the British uh, for the to be used as the headquarters of the big mining effort that many countries are involved in to divide up and mine the mineral pie in Antarctica. And what she said is that there have always been a lot of US military advisors um, board members and so forth who were always around Christ Church on the South Island of uh, New Zealand. She said they were always around. Well, it's one of the uh, military um, headquarters for the U.S. military in, in that region in Southeast Asia. And, and it always has been, but it's also the jumping off point for the military uh, expeditions to Antarctica. So that tradition just continued as uh, a new purpose is now being rolled out for New Zealand and Australia with uh, Obama's new pivot to Asia. So she told me that Janet Napolitano, when she was head of Homeland Security, brought Homeland Security and FEMA down to Christchurch and to the South Island. 
and she said they are using frequencies and EMF and harp attacks on the citizenry of the South Island to depopulate. They're, they're just uh, killing them. They're murdering them. And she said there are only like 1,200 or 1,500 people in the village she lives in. And she said in uh, one, one or two days, eight or nine of the main food uh, providers um, in her, her town, they all died of heart attacks no matter what age they were. Well, we know all about those, those, uh, those police and FBI and CIA heart attacks that they just do with a frequency. They, they um, do it with microwave from police antennas. And she said um, they are now stopping cars in the South Island and if there's anything uh, that is not completely 100% correct or if these people are bartering or trading food or other items uh, with each other and they're caught doing that, their cars are confiscated, the police go to their homes and remove their refrigerators and um, find them and it's, uh, this is part of the new fascism that comes with Janet Napolitano, Homeland Security and FEMA. And they're very, very, very active. Um, so they are rolling out the new agenda in the new headquarters and the new takeover of New Zealand. And she also said that Christchurch was on a list uh, of the that the Rockefeller Foundation has on their website that lists a hundred new world order cities and I think they have some um, title that references their disaster free zones in other words harp won't be bothering them <laughs> and um, believe it or not not just Christ Church is on that list uh, there are 33 cities that they've uh, announced already out of the 100 total and the city of Berkeley in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, and Alameda are all listed on that list. And that is very, very big because in these New World Order cities, uh, they will not allow people into them that they don't want there. And when you walk around San Francisco now, um, like we've been to some conferences over there since uh, the beginning of the year and every time you walk by a hotel lobby um, we would get zapped we wouldn't even be able to go into the the lobby because the wireless was very painful and so that is how these new world order cities will be organized plus they will start closing off roads and tunnels and access so that people, as they have done in London, are not allowed into the cities at all. They're starting to do that with our public parks, with our national parks, with camping grounds. Uh, this is called the Commons. And three or four years ago, when I was in Canada, campaigning against uranium mining, with the uh, member of the Canadian Parliament, Alex Adamanenko, from the Kootenays in, um, in um, uh, eastern British Columbia. Uh, people were telling me that the commons and the parks areas and, and the commons areas were being fenced off in Canada and people were not being allowed into them. So they are squeezing a tube of toothpaste. They're squeezing people farmers, people in the country, into cities where they have total control, where they have smart meters, where they can monitor everyone 24 hours a day, uh, where they can control the food supply. They've already done an inventory of the whole Bay Area since January 1st. They've sent strange people, mostly in white vehicles, 
into all the food stores, the grocery stores, the um, cafes, the restaurants, and the whole color scheme has changed. They've repainted the decorations, for instance, in Trader Joe's and, and other grocery stores with New World Order colors. And if you look at the Google uh, backdrop on, uh, on the internet, you, you Google um, Google, all those New World Order colors and these really stupid graphics that you would do for kindergartners or young kids um, are, are de rigueur now. Uh, this whole New World Order thing is taking over all our senses, our spirituality. Uh, our culture, uh, cultural norms, our music, everything. And it's very sterilizing. It's horrible. So, uh, getting back to these hundred New World Order cities, these are worldwide. These are worldwide. Yes, they are. On yeah. all the continents. Yeah, and would you say that what characterizes these cities is that they're generally known as progressive cities that are being taken over, or what? Uh, no, they're not progressive at all. They're uh, they're like Singapore. They're oh. they're uh, they're tearing down the old buildings. They're building new structures that are that are new world order cities. Um, if you look at pictures of of Singapore, that's very much the model, the template for this new world order, and um, it just doesn't have the um, the warm charm and culture and and um, the the sense of of nice living and and um, um, it, it's just so sterile it's much more soulless. So, soulless. it's soulless it's uh, all wireless it's mind controlled it's apartment buildings they're not even building houses they're warehousing transhumanist. transhumanist is exactly how to describe it it is transhumanist right now uh, sh talking about Singapore uh, what have we learned about Napolitano and this whole global player from the uh, uh, Malaysia MH30 false flag, the, the Malaysia Airlines MH30 false flag, it's which is something that, that you and in our programs, we actually broke that. We, we actually yes. solved that problem. It's uh, have to do with Singapore. It's it's MH370, Alfred. Yeah, just, yeah. Just to MH, did, yes. did I say something different? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. It, yes. Yeah, I meant MH370. Yes, it's a MH370. So uh, what happened is uh, we investigated that and did um, an interview, a couple interviews on it. And those uh, were surprisingly popular. I was really shocked at how interested people were, but we do do good interviews and provide good information. Um, but what I discovered in doing investigating that is that uh, the satellite company in Marsat, I N M A R S A T, that hijacked the whole investigation of the disappearance of MH370, um, they hijacked the investigation and they must be very powerful to take uh, 25 militaries and just completely take over the whole investigation, shove Malaysia and everybody else out of the way. And um, they have taken the location of MH370 all the way to almost Antarctica south of Africa now and um, I discovered that Inmarsat has their headquarters in uh, London, it's a British company and that they have been tracking uh, the all of the ocean traffic and shipping for at least 40 years. They, um, they wanted to open up a new tracking 
uh, industry uh, of commercial planes. And so the disappearance of MH370 uh, facilitates the, the support, public support for better traffic, trafficking of uh, commercial planes. There are like 9,300 flights a day that land at, at uh, hundreds of airports around the world. Those are major flights. And if they got $7 for each of those flights, that's a much bigger revenue than the shipping traffic. Uh, if you compare how fast ships move compared to how fast planes move. So I discovered that Homeland Security and FEMA and the Department of Energy and smart meters and other departments of the U.S. government are all, uh, their data is loaded on Inmarsat. So here we have the beginnings of a global single source entity, which is what they want to do, go to single source for everything in centralized control in Britain. So here is the agenda rolling out for Janet Napolitano going to 15 countries in the Commonwealth and signing contracts to provide Homeland Security and FEMA to them. It is the beginning of the fascist rollout globally and I think Janet Napolitano is a very big player. Of course she's representing the US government and the University of California but underneath it all, the weapons of mass destruction exist for the bankers and financiers. The University of California develops and manufactures the weapons of mass destruction. And the University of California laboratories developed the HARP technologies secretly with black budgets during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And here we have all these entities converging. They were compartmentalized projects that no one really kind of noticed, but when you put them all together, boy, it's a really ugly, really ugly game and a really ugly picture. Now, uh, just picking one of those things, do you think that the current invasion or onslaught uh, of uh, young children from Central America which are being who are being transported in a military fashion uh, to overwhelm the, the southern border and all of the immigration facilities and social facilities of the you know, southern and middle uh, and even northern uh, U.S. Do you think that that was set up during uh, Janet, Janet Napolitano's uh, reign as head of Homeland Security? Well, it very likely was uh, because it's suddenly happening when she's doing this takeover. But I do think it's a distraction from much more important issues and no issue today is as important as the environmental and public health impact of Fukushima. That had three over 300 million hits on it if you did a Google search two years ago. It's dropped down to 20 million now and I've noticed that a lot of uh, information, documents, websites are being cleaned off of the internet, especially about uh, depleted uranium, uh, military related programs. And a lot of activists are reporting to me that they've been injured and had to stop their blogs or couldn't write as much or whatever. And I think these are um, these injuries are inflicted by the police or, or Homeland Security to uh, take people out from their constitutional rights uh, to free speech. You mean, uh, uh, now, that, but 
So, so that's a general comment. Yes. As to all issues. Yes. Oh, now I okay. Ask me what. Uh, get me back on track on the issue. Okay. The question. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I took you off track. And oh. For that I apologize. <laughs> and 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 that was, I I was just reaching into Janet Napolitano's past. Ah, yes, 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 yes. And and since she had been at Homeland Security. It seemed that she would have set up this invasion of children into the, the um, sex trafficking, child trafficking markets, and just overwhelming uh, the southern borders of the U.S. And that is one one of the uh, prime notations of sovereignty of a nation is that you can control your own borders. And so the borders of the U.S. are being dissolved now through the, this exercise. The borders are being dissolved, but also um, the, um, the perversion and the twisted um, and sick mentality of these people like her who are leading this this overthrow of humanity and the, and this transhumanism agenda uh, which is dehumanizing people changing their DNA and everything um, it's all part of how these people think uh, people it's it's just how they think and I believe that um, the trafficking of children uh, from Central and South American countries and Mexico is nothing new because the Department of Justice in the United States and through the courts has done exactly the same thing to American children uh, just harvesting them uh, like uh, entities or, or quantities that make money for the Department of Justice for instance um, something like 3,000 children a year these are called throwaway children are kidnapped identified photographed and kidnapped by the police departments these photos are were sent to george hw bush because he was the global leader of the global pedophile movement and that is used to blackmail people in power so they can always be controlled and uh, these, these 3,000 children or 30,000 children, it's a lot of children. They are, it's actually 300,000 children, adult, uh, not adult children, but throwaway kids, teenage kids who run away and so forth. And they're picked up and um, they're taken to hospitals where CIA doctors are waiting for them and there are organs are harvested and the bodies are disposed of in the hospital process of what they do with um, human remains it's a good place to hide what they're doing and the justice department makes um, something like five billion dollars a year on harvesting organs of american children uh, the courts are also kidnapping and hijacking children through the uh, child protective services and just stealing uh, children from perfectly good parents in fact the uh, people the 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 um, the adoptive parents or the the um, the caretakers of the children that when they're removed from their parents custody um, they if they're good uh, to the children and do good parenting they're fired they want abusive uh, perverted people to uh, manipulate and violate these children that are taken away from their parents so this is an old old practice in the United States and it's nothing new uh, they're may they're just harvesting children anywhere they can get them to use as sex slaves or uh, or for pedophile rings for um, 
a number of things, cheap labor. Um, the Bohemian Grove uses Native American boys, young teenage boys, for their pedophile parties during Bohemian Grove. I've talked to some of them. And um, it said it's a global phenomenon that, that these ki children are not just coming from Central America and Mexico into the United States. It's happening all over the world. In fact, a group of men in the Boston area who called themselves rabbis, but who were not actually rabbis, were running a an organ uh, selling ring or organ harvesting ring globally for medical tourism which they sent them to South their customers to South America to get these organs that have been harvested from Palestinians uh, it by Israel so this is such a racket it makes so much money um, it's it's going to happen so I don't think it's anything new. I think it's always been going on, but I think it's being used to cover uh, news that the uh, the government doesn't want the Americans to have news about other things. And the, this is sort of uh, part collateral damage yes. of this overthrow and this new world order. Yes, it is. Modus operandi. Right. Yes. Okay. Now, let's get down to some of the specifics here. You, uh, uh, you've been focusing on some of the specifics that are happening in this template in Berkeley, California, so you can really show how this template for the overthrow of countries through these cities through these New World Order cities works. And you talked about uh, UC constructing a medieval wall in Berkeley. Could you talk about that? Well, I live on College Avenue, which is in a very nice neighborhood uh, near the Berkeley campus. And it's up from the San Francisco Bay on solid bedrock. Um, if you go downhill further uh, there's a whole area of the bay uh, going north south following the shoreline of the bay the east bay that is landfill and since this is one of the uh, most dangerous places to live in the u.s because of earthquakes we're on the san andreas fault which is very active um, this is uh, uh, you want to always be on bedrock, and there there's there's socioeconomic changes once you cross College Avenue from the east side that I live on to the west side, just across the street. But the um, the building values, the property values, the style, everything gets poorer and poorer as you go towards the bay to the west. And so what they've done, the campus, is to delineate College Avenue as the medieval wall between the halves, and that would include the Berkeley campus, the Lawrence Berkeley lab, <coughs> and the uh, more affluent people who live in that area to uh, the have-nots are on the east on the west side of College Avenue and everything changes um, just by crossing the street it's very strange but they always had medieval walls around cities in uh, in the medieval era and people actually lived in the medieval walls people would um, like some of the famous uh, Italian architects and, and painters would join each other and they would sit, Leonardo da Vinci and people like that, they would sit in pubs in the medieval city walls and have social discussions and, and erudite discussions and so forth. So there was a lot happening in the medieval wall. It wasn't just protection. 
but they also parked troublemakers in the medieval wall too so they could expel them at any time they wanted to and um, living here and observing because I'm a scientist I like to observe things I've learned a lot and what I'm seeing uh, is the militarization and the construction of this medieval wall and the peopling with it, it with particular types of people in particular types of activity that have to do with fascism, social control, political control, things like that. And what they're doing along College Avenue is uh, they have cell houses. These are big old 1905 houses that were farmhouses. And they have lots of rooms and lots of space and so forth. And they are turning these into active cells, cell houses, where students living in the surrounding apartment buildings, uh, cheap apartments, cheap buildings, and these students are brought into these cell houses very, very um, hierarchically and very systematically and they're trained in hacking they're trained in infiltration they're trained in um, uh, um, gang stalking all of these technologies of political and social control and then they're sent back to their um, countries including in the US to overthrow their own government so Berkeley is and has always been a big CIA center and um, much to the regret of many governments they've discovered that foreign students uh, their own students who were sent to foreign universities come back and overthrow their governments and the US is one of the biggest training grounds it's not just the University of California that does this um, but it's a very intense one it's one of the big ones because they have the the nuclear weapons labs where the de they're developing all the technologies so they use the students and the campuses to do the beta tests on the new technologies of political control that are developed by the nuclear weapons laboratories and there is a hierarchy um, antennas are a very big part of this training and the android cell phones are the particular uh, cell phone of preference that was actually designed just for this kind of um, activity with applications that uh, can be used to um, soften up the, pub the public, the civilian population target them with and um, to further uh, facilitate the overthrow of the United States. Now the androids also represent or reflect the, uh, the transhumanism uh, movement which is also pumped out of those uh, classrooms at UC Berkeley and other universities and the androids refer to um, humans that are both male and female they're sort of their sexuality is splintered that's androgynous android oh, what is, is interface with intelligent machinery oh I'm sorry android android means interface with intelligent machinery so that confirms that these people who are being trained in the the gang stalking and other technologies they themselves are androgynous and the amount of nuclear pollution that has been introduced into the atmosphere since 1945 since Hiroshima and Nagasaki most of it is depleted uranium and um, and it is a hormone and estrogen disruptor so it is changing the sexuality the sexual expression and the fertility of all 
the young people around the world and the that were exposed in utero or even after birth to this global nuclear pollution and it is feminizing the males and de and mas masculinating uh, it's the masculinization of females and uh, I have talked to professors uh, one in particular who was studying the sexuality of Southeast Asia he said I never could figure out why the young men are so feminine now in Southeast Asia and I said well I went to two war crimes tribunals in Malaysia and uh, people came up to me after my talk and asked me if intersex where male and female reproductive cells are now found in in animal life and in humans um, that that would be a hermaphrodite person uh, why is that an epidemic globally now and especially in Southeast Asia well it's it's happening because of the um, the the war weapons that that have been chosen and used and promoted um, and have this global effect of, of global nuclear pollution so these androids and their applications that are being used by groups of students and groups of young people who feel themselves splintered from and different from uh, the normal citizenry um, it's it's all part of the dehuman dehumanization and the transhuman humanistic um, movement that that cues into as well we were uh, talking off camera about the whole issue of child trafficking yes. child sexual abuse child ritual abuse the tremendous amount of uh, the connection between uh, child sexual abuse and the New World Order. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, in in indigenous societies, um, inbreeding is absolutely one of the priorities that these indigenous societies avoid. And uh, you may have heard the expression seven generations. Um, in the Native American communities, whatever decisions they make, whatever actions they take as a tribe, they are supposed to consider how that will affect the next seven generations before they act on it. And if it's going to have a negative effect, they, they won't do it. It's morally uh, prohibited by the, it's a taboo. Um, that comes out of the Mongolian traditions which are Central Asian uh, where they had very strict taboos and you had to memorize all seven generations on all sides of your family and know every person in the last seven generations of your family and uh, that would be so that you were sure not to intermarry or breed with any of those people in the last seven generations of your family that's a lot of people and they knew that inbreeding was very dangerous and very unhealthy and was not sustainable to a healthy tribe with a a a healthy successful future now that has been completely violated now in Western society pedophilia is everywhere it it's everywhere in the Catholic Church um, and I'm not really sure where it came from but I know that the Habsburg dynasties uh, royal dynasties rather than waging war on the battlefield to get land and mineral resources they waged war in the bed is what they said and by intermarriages strategic intermarriages they acquired whole countries and princeton princedoms and and fiefdoms 
and um, and so in order to keep that big empire together, they they um, made a practice of inbreeding to the point that every bloodline, every dynasty exterminated, extinguished itself within 200 years from the ill effects of too much inbreeding. And for instance, Charles II, who was uh, the king of uh, a Borbo, I'm sorry, he was a Habsburg king of Spain. He was the product of an uncle who married his niece, but there had been many generations of inbreeding before that, and poor Charles was so defective and deformed from uh, mutated DNA that he could not reproduce. His tongue was so large in his mouth that he drooled all the time and he could hardly talk. He wasn't able to walk until he was uh, eight years old. And what has happened is not only the Habsburg dynasties did that, but the Houdin Jews, or the High Jews, the court Jews who advised them, like the Rothschilds, have also taken up that practice of inbreeding to keep the money and the property in the family, instead of dividing it up when marriages occur and, um, and uh, the children divide it up or whatever. So, if everybody in the family is related to each other, that wealth is available in one way or another to the whole family, the extended family. And that's how they've done it. But I was looking at the Habsburg portraits of all these defective, deformed, mentally ill people, and, um, and some of them were uh, insane, and I suddenly, I just suddenly clicked on me the strange heads and odd shapes and everything elongated. Um, I looked at Jacob Rothschild, and he's the product, obviously, of too much inbreeding. And it's these people who have had too much inbreeding in order to acquire wealth and then to hold on to it. They're the ones running the world today. And they're running it out of Vienna, Austria, the Habsburgs and the Habsburg traditions in Prussia, what was Prussia, and out of the city of London, which is the stronghold for the, um, the merchants of Venice, the Jews who were expelled from Venice and relocated with other uh, Jews around Europe to London, the city of London, and they live within the ancient Roman walls of the original city of London. That is the economic center of the world. But the Rothschilds who control that actually work for the Habsburg network, which is the top level. And even Queen Elizabeth and the British throne are lower in that hierarchy. Right, right. Well, um, let's just switch now, and, and uh, uh, maybe uh, since we're coming to the end of this segment, uh, go to this question, and I know that uh, we've covered him on a number of false flags earlier, and we, we know that he's indeed a very devious person, and I'm referring to uh, U.S. President Barack Obama, who's gone under other names such as Barry Satoro. Um, and it's very difficult to understand his role in certain areas because he's so devious as to what the roles are. What role do you think Barack Obama has in this template of destruction in specifically in Berkeley and the Bay Area and in the larger plan of overthrowing the U.S. this way? Well, first of all, um, President Obama is a third generation uh, CIA agent. He was trained by them. 
his mother was CIA. She was in the UN uh, Food and Environment Program or something in Indonesia and other countries in Southeast Asia. His grandmother uh, and his grandfather were CIA. His grandfather was in the OSS in World War II and later went into the CIA. He was in the military. And his grandmother was vice president of the Bank of Hawaii or the Bank of Honolulu in Honolulu. And she actually funded the overthrow through that bank by the CIA of governments in Southeast Asian countries. For instance, she funded the overthrow of President Sukarno of Indonesia. And he also hung out a lot at the East-West Center where the CIA trained, for instance, the young African leaders when the colonies were returned to the indigenous people in Africa. Um, the um, indigenous leaders, the young people who would be the new leaders of, of, that, of their own countries, were sent to the East-West Center to be trained by the CIA to go back and overthrow legitimately elected leaders so that the CIA and other powers could put in whoever they wanted to so it would be easier to, to steal the mineral resources of African countries in their new independence. So um, Obama was already positioned, even before he was born practically, to play this role. He went to school and lived in Indonesia. He speaks Indonesian. Um, he's, he, was, he was the CIA pick for the pivot to Asia uh, to be in the White House and implement this. He's. Um, I really don't like him at all, <laughs> but the CIA does, and uh, when it's all finished, when you come to the end of the, the question and answer on him, he's just a pawn. Uh, the politicians are all pawns. They do it to make money. They go into politics to make money. He doesn't really care about us. Politicians don't care about the people. They care about making lots of money and they care about power and they care about doing just enough to get donations to get reelected. So um, Obama is the man for the job and, and this job is the pivot to Southeast Asia and he's doing exactly what they want him to do because he has no independent thoughts of his own, that's for sure, and the Rockefellers put him into the White House anyway. Right. Okay, well, we, we always um, uh, ask you at, at the end of these, at, at the end of these, these, these programs, uh, how, <clears throat> how can we as individual citizens, how should we react to this news and how, how can we move forward uh, now, now that we know that we have this uh, this machine that is coming in with this new lethal uh, uh, technology and organization and dehumanizing. What are your thoughts on that? I think that right conduct, always doing the right thing, no matter what, no matter how tempted you are to save money and do something else or make a different choice, uh, life choice or lifestyle or whatever. What matters in times of chaos is that you do right conduct to get you and your family and your children and your friends through it. It is induced, introduced chaos to do land grabs and to take things away from us. Our accumulated wealth, the, the fruit of our labor our entire lives, is what they're stealing from every generation. And they do it with wars and false flags and all kinds of things. 
but it's a gigantic hijacking and theft of humanity's hard-earned money and I'm I'm just don't think it's uh I'm not going to give all of mine to them because they want it that belongs to me to my future to my family's future and so forth so we need to first of all be educated on what's happening we need to be aware of the history how was this played out in history there's nothing to be afraid of Alfred this has always been happening and it's always by the same people and the templates are always the same it's coming out of one place and they keep doing it, rolling it over and over and over again to steal. We know what they want. They want to steal the product of our energy, the output over our lifetime. So awareness and education about it is the most important first step. Secondly, we have to be realistic about expectations. Living in America was a free ride since World War II and the Rockefellers said just sit back and leave the driving to us and we did that people trusted them and look at the mess we're in now we're going we're being flushed down the toilet with uh, <laughs> post haste with very few choices and almost nowhere to go to escape from it so we need to build networks we need to build family we need to build extended family and extended networks and there is a whole teeming world of humanity out there uh, there's lots to do there's lots to discover and there are lots of answers but we have to come together and share our information and share our resources and share our ideas and and solve this this issue together the group of people doing this is such a tiny handful compared to the 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 corpus of humanity the the extension of humanity on every continent um, I mean we can't stop them I don't believe that but it's our spirituality that guides us to do the right thing it energizes us to continue trying no matter what it's it gets us through hell and out of the door into the sunshine eventually if you can persevere but these are very major changes there these are very powerful and very dangerous technologies but you know we can still do it because we have to it's our choice and that's why I think you and I are both doing these interviews and putting this information out um, it's to let people know where the information is they may not be ready for it now that's not our business our business is to put it out there lay it on the table throw it around the world like confetti and just let it come down like snowflakes and people pick it up and they actually actually figure out better ways to use it and to to do with it than we could ever dream of telling them our situation is not their situation locally but the global situation is global and it is the same now because nothing we do today does not affect all other living things on this planet right now you built a central website where a lot of your information yes. is accessible. Could you share that with us? Yes, the website is info, and there are recommendations under the different buttons you can push uh, for web pages uh, to explore. Uh, Currents has um, my latest interviews and articles in this our, this interview will be posted there uh, lifestyle has um, recommendations on how to choose a water filtration system that's the most important thing today that people can do is to have a reverse osmosis water filter water filtration system to remove chemicals 
and radiation from their drinking water. It's really easy to put in in your own kitchen. Um, it also recommends what foods are good to eat to counteract the effects of radiation that we're inhaling, we're drinking, we're ingesting, it's in our food, it's in our bodies. But there are ways to keep your immune system boosted and to mitigate the the environmental and uh, and public health effects of ionizing radiation and what it does to, from uh, internal uh, radiation exposure. Thank you. Well, we we want to thank you for um, all of the um, <clears throat> uh, insightful uh, observation and courageous hard work that you. Um, expended to put together today's program and for the time that you've taken for it. And uh, we look uh, forward to uh, having you come again on our program as events develop. Thank you, Lorraine. Well, what I'd like to talk about in our next interview is um, how people can rock around their neighborhoods and begin to see the changes that look small or they're not even noticeable, but these are leading to these very dangerous technologies of complete surveillance and social and political control. And um, for instance, walk up and down the streets and look up at the transformers and you will see in some neighborhoods that they are taking perfectly good and not old transformers off of the poles and they're replacing them with much smaller transformers that have 10 times as much power. These are to transmit very heavy frequencies into blocks of neighborhood where they can much more closely control them. And these are the beginning of the electromagnetic invisible barbed wire fences that will keep us in our homes in our neighborhoods, in our village, locally, and immobilize us. Because they don't want us moving around. They don't want us exchanging information. And once I explain how this is organized and what it looks like, people can go around their own neighborhoods and start sharing that information with other people. And what you don't want is smart meters. You want to fight that as hard as you can. That is on the Inmarsat satellites, and it's in the London headquarters of Inmarsat. They have access to all the smart meters around the world. And every electronic device that you are using in your home, they know within seconds what you're doing in London and on those Inmarsat satellites. So these are the kinds of steps and resistance that people can take and should take but they need to be educated about it they need to know what to look for and then they need to know what they can do about it there's nothing to be afraid humanity has survived this kind of suppression before and I like what President Putin of Russia said uh, a very very sophisticated KGB agent by the way and a man who knows a lot and has a lot of wisdom and very measured in his diplomacy and his approach today. And he said, this will never work. They're going to try to do it. They're going to hurt a lot of people. But he said it will never work. And someone who's running the former Soviet Union, I think he knows what he's talking about. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred.